I think all of these crimes, as you call them, these deeds that the Washita, the white man, has committed time and time again a million fold, which they call business ventures and virtues and so forth. If an Indian does it, it's a crime. Who created Russell Means, Dennis Banks, and all the others? Remember this in that defense there. <laughs> the federal government created them. You gave them birth. And that's why you're out here today, or you could be in the, your nice air condition your nice air conditioned offices back in Washington. But uh, maybe Mr. Nixon was adamant that he ordered you out here and I get out there and talk to those Indians. By gosh, they're stirring up things over there. I got my hands full of this Watergate thing. You know? <laughs> but I hope you've been comfortable. Hey, with three fingers of scotch, I'd be a real hell, you know? <laughs> but I'm not a drinking Indian. Uh, in my old age, I like to think that uh, I'm a loving kind of Indian. I like to create things. I look over the, uh, the past in my life, and I remember all of those beautiful women that I missed. <laughs> White women. I'm afraid you'll make fun of me because I sound like my grandma, you know. That's me and my quota, Lohe. Deep down. Hey, slowly, actually. <laughs> One of my best friends right there. He knows that your people have kicked him down. You've made him helpless. He's a stranger in his own land. He knows that. Many of us, many other white people know it too. Now, I think there's going to be a lot of letters going into the big brass there in Washington, D.C., and when I get time, I'm going to write several myself. It doesn't pay to, to write to the Secretary of the Interior because they'll just send it right on back here, and they, uh, uh, the cops, uh, they'll develop a big dossier on you like they have on me. Elven words, you know. <laughs> and they came all the way back, and they file them in a pigeonhole back here at home, see. Of course, you know, I want to tell you about uh, that fascination for Washichi words that I developed <laughs> late in life when I was about 40 years old. <laughs> I surmise that I've always had an, aver an aversion of ever going near the Department of the Interior. That is, a diversion that's very pronounced. For fear of some bureaucrat's uh, maternal ancestor running out from under the premises to bite me. You know? <laughs> Real cockatiel. I didn't come here to insult anybody again. <laughs> Especially Mr. Soller. We've got along fine. But in closing, I want to say one thing. The reason I got it, I, I got uh, uh, taken for a trip, manacled like an animal, up to Rapid City. Now, I was fortunate that I knew the magistrate there, and he showed me some respect. I never knew the Washita respected me that much until I got up there. <laughs> he said that uh, I was a responsible citizen in the community. <laughs> and, I, of course, he gave me a $1,000 personal reconnaissance bond and appointed one of my best friends as my attorney. I think he's one of my best friends, but, you know... You can be friends with a white man all the way, but there's always one little niche reserve. Deep in them smoldering embers in the heart of every Indian, they're still there. The Teton, the Teton Sioux Nation still lives. You haven't snuffed it out yet. You never will. There's something that holds a white man at arm's length. 
He'll be my fishing buddy. I'll grow up with him. I'll even be an altar boy and serve mass with him. And I'll be a boy soprano and reduce a nun to tears with the Ave Maria. And <laughs> later on in life, I'll read what they did to those boy sopranos and tenors in Rome, Italy. And that's the most frightening thing I ever read about. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm going to get this show on the road and go make me some money. A lot of that watch me feel happiness, you know? And spell happiness with two dollar signs on the end of it. <laughs> and that's what we need. Every Indian should be an attorney like Ramon Rubidoux and our other Indian attorneys. Um, Mr. Gonzalez, my, my, one of my best friend's nephews here. Young boy, one of my good friends. And there's another friend of mine, a couple of them over there, Rooks and all that. Glad to see them here. And the man with the machine, did you get all this, partner? Huh? I'm sure glad you did. Then you bureaucrats need an attorney. Come around and see me. But the one thing bad about it is... They won't let me represent you. I can go ahead and represent myself, that's all. You see, the white man made those rules, and he made this law for us to live by. Yet, uh, he calls it justice, like that old saw, J-U-S-T, and then there's another word, U-S, just us. Hey, <laughs> Not the Indian, not the Indian, no justice. <laughs> but I'm telling you now, if that little Indian boy is formulating the uh, the scheme in his mind to make that laser beam in the form of a peace pipe, you will not be smiling, I assure you. Is that Washington Monument, it'll come to pass one day that you will not have enough marshals. And marshals, I mean no offense against you. I love each and every one of you up to arm's length. I'm not a pilgrim. I'm an Indian. <laughs> the pilgrims made those mistakes for us to learn by. <laughs> you see? And thanks, somebody, even the white man's own Jesus Christ, that I am an Indian. I'm glad. I think that's about all I can expound about today. I want to apologize for not really having become that Ciceronian soon. But maybe at another time, at the proper time when we've got the, perhaps the whole Senate in front of me, that would be more opportune to really let loose <laughs> and tell you about all your great men, your slave keepers. Oh, incidentally, i got to tell you about Columbus. <laughs> i got eight of Bancroft's works in my library. Kid skin covered, beautiful volumes, and some nut come along and he offered me two hundred dollars. That's fifty dollars a piece for my arithmetic is right. Two fools met. I wouldn't sell them. Because in there it is perfectly clear again that Columbus died completely oblivious in Central America of this North American continent ever having existed or did not exist. He didn't even know it was here because he'd never seen it. He died with paresis. That's the last stage in syphilis, a social disease. He was, he was a keeper of slaves, both Indian and Negro. And I like to think of Eric the Red having been here first. They beat, uh, beat Columbus here, and they really discovered America. And I wish they'd quit telling those lousy stories about George Washington having cut down that cherry tree, because that's a damn lie, too. Some English preacher concocted that story. Um, Columbus... I don't know how they could... Well, that's the way the white man construes things. You see, he ends up way off course down there trying to find India. Then he finds Central America. <laughs> then later on in life, there's only one friend I think we had was Jefferson. He, he acted as a fence when Napoleon sold the Louisiana Purchase and the whole Teton Sioux Nation, the northern half of which was the Teton Sioux Nation, to the United States government for $15 million, including all the savages, which were our ancestors, of course. We still belong to the United States. Uh, citizenship or no. 
But like I say, compulsory citizenship, there's your big problem that you're going to have back there in Washington, gentlemen, and you, ma'am. Compulsory citizenship. Don't cut it, partner. <laughs> I can be a citizen and then forfeit all my tribal rights, which you will never let me exercise to be an American citizen, perhaps. Maybe I'm really blaspheming, but wasn't it Shaw who said that all great truths begin as blasphemies? Where the hell am I at? 1868 treaty. <laughs> 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 well, anyhow, it says that there in uh, Article 11, you don't think I got cases in federal court? Look at that, man. <laughs> Where the heck is that thing? Oh, here's one I almost missed. Pardon me, just to bear with me. Oh, here, here's the reason I couldn't get any land. You remember back in 1966 when I fired Yvonne Wilson, who is the, the wife of the present chairman? And then he went before the grand jury and they wanted to take just the Indian and, and not the white man. He and another white man went before the grand jury and Doyle, the then U.S. attorney, came out and asked me, I, said, I got noble, and I said, I'd dumb you up and be a wooden Indian. You take them both or, or none. I made a big mistake. I've regretted it since. I should have let him take, take Wilson. <laughs> no. Here's a letter that caused me all the grief right here over my, over my signature and I chaired the House of Authority. Now, where's that treaty? <laughs> there it is, here. Article 11, in consideration of the advantages and benefits conferred by this treaty, get that, the advantages and benefits, <laughs> and the many pledges of friendship yet, <laughs> by the United States, the tribes who are parties of this agreement hereby stipulate that they will relinquish all right to occupy permanently the territory outside their reservation as herein defined, but yet Reserve the right to hunt on any lands north of the north of North Platte and on the Republican Fork of the Smoky Hill River, which is way the hell in Kansas, so long as the buffalo may range thereon, and some Washitas breeding a lot of buffalo between here and Kansas yet. <laughs> they only out there cod store. <laughs> in such numbers as to justify the chase. No. There's some, what the white man calls an ambiguity. It's not clear. Now, in everything else, they interpret that in favor of the Indians, see? But in this case, they don't because there's a million game wardens down there. If you go down there and, and shoot a deer or a buffalo, of course, that includes deer, too. It's supposed to be interpreted in our favor, see? I hope to make a lot of money sometime in my life. I hope I do, anyway. And I'm going to exercise these different treaties. Let's try them, anyway. I might have to call up Ramon to get me out of jail a couple of times. <laughs> now here, here's the real. No wonder we're broke. Now after 27 years, the government saw fit to give back the Okinawan Islands to the Japanese in spite of Pearl Harbor. The devastation that they had wrought there in 1941 on December 7th. And the only one, the Republic of South Africa, 150 million, they're the only ones who's ever paid us. Now, the source of this information, <coughs> Agency for International Development, U.S. State Department. It's more than this figure now, of course, but this is the figure then. 138 billion, 28 million, 500,000. What the United States is trying to say to the free world with all their arrogance of power is Look what we're doing for our Indians, our Indians, possessively. I tell you, we belong to them. <laughs> we're their property. We're outnumbered. We have, uh, we only represent four tenths of one percent of over 200 million people. A Hossop even outnumbers us. He's 11.8 percent. So it's ridiculous that we could ever start a war with them. But there's going to be a lot of cages rattled, I assure you, before that little Indian student. Or maybe the guy's over there now. I don't know. You'll press a button and bingo will go that Washington Monument after the father of the Washington's country. That Indian there, these other Indians, strangers in their own way. Now that part of it, in my opinion, is not humorous at all. 
The next time, the next confrontation, when I see you people again, I hope that I'm better prepared, that I'm more eloquent, and that there is a hundred thousand other Washita sitting on each side of you, and back of you, in front of you, on top of you, and on the bottom. And I want to talk to all of you. And I'm going to keep on talking. That's the only thing I know. I can't uh, start a war because we're too few. But one thing we can do, we can take the Washichu's language and we can send it to war like a man named Churchill. You know, he was part Indian, they tell me. I read it in some book, his mother. The noblest breed of them all. And look what he did to Europe. Look what he did to the United States. Now, here's an Indian. We don't have to do anything. But they bestow citizenship on you because of a guilty conscience of commercialized Christianity and feigned democracy. You understand what I mean? Now, here is uh, the Marquis de Lafayette, Sir Winston Churchill. Look at the great feats they had to attain. They only received honorary citizenship. Look at us. We didn't have to do nothing. But accept compulsory citizenship, if you ought to accept it, against all the Christian virtues and against everything for which America stands. The Constitution itself, allegedly self-enforceable, that's supposed to hold up the supreme laws of the land. Well, I like this tonight. I got him in a pocket right behind the eight ball, and I shoot a good cue. <laughs> He's going to run for another term. I hope he does. He's a good Washitu governor. I mean, if they let me in there to that tokenism vote with the state, I'll go in there and vote for tonight, see? And I like to argue with him. He's going to pay me a, a pretty good price someday to paint his portraits, you know, because he knows who the real artist laureate is in this locality. <laughs> he knows who the maestro is. <laughs> Incidentally, when I was on the racetrack, I climbed the highest mountain of equine portraits. I found it a hollow victory. I came back to the Indian country. Now, I've got to take up that profession again and make some money for my boys because I want to send them to some nice law school where they'll have a license to steal in the Washitu Society. <laughs> no chance for both. I got three boys, twins and another one. I regret that I didn't study law myself as a young lad. However, it's been fun. I want to thank you and remind you people again, always remember that Washington Monument. When you get up in the morning and go to work, you think about me telling you that some little Indian boy might drive that thing across there, it looks like a peace pipe, and he'll press it, and that thing will look like a lit paper match, if this thing continues. That's not a threat. That is the incontrovertibility of the truth, and I'm not a prophet, I don't think. But if it does come to pass, I hope they consider me a prophet. <laughs> I stand here with my people and I want to reiterate my little chubby aunt's words that she told you a while ago the sad state of affairs there's despotism here on the reservation for some strange reason it's only the full blood who gets drunk and they lob him in the jail Keep him there overnight in that dirty place. And there's some agency I'm going to learn about. I knew about it once, but I'm going to write down there. You know, when I was on the bench, Roy Martin and I used to keep that jail clean. Those prisoners got turkey on Christmas and on Thanksgiving. And I don't think that uh, I was ever too harsh with only the people who beat up their women or something like that. But generally, Wallace, Little Figure, Venus Forebear, and a lot of these people here, Full-blood Indian people know that I stand by their side, in front of my own Yeska people. And I've been that way since I was a little boy. There's a lot of Indian people know that. I think Harry Conroy knows it. A lot of the old-timers that are gone now. Uh, I can name them Caesar Lonell, Kai Eagle. Peggy, Peg Leg, Jim Red Cloud, all those old people, Charlie Red Cloud, all of them. These people right here, Frank, all of them, his daughter, they know where I stand. 
to help the people who are unfortunate, who don't know the Washita way, how to get along in this world, and lie and cheat and steal just like the rest of them. Now, so I'm an expert at I used to be out there off the reservation. And you know, I, that's, just, that's strange. I was in, I got four battle stars in the Navy, and I never got a scratch except one right up here, and I never got a purple heart. And I always tell them that some gal out there south of the tracks in, in uh, Wells, Nevada, where it looked better on her than it did me. You know? <laughs> Had a picture of Washington on it, you know. <laughs> that kind of hero I was. <laughs> but um, maybe somebody else wants to say something. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Again, it's my fervent prayer that don't forget me, people. Don't forget my people. Don't forget these people here, especially these people right here. Thank you very much. Get on my phone.